Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Steve Oliner. I'm a resident scholar here at AEI and also the co-director of our Housing Risk Center. Welcome to this event this morning on housing finance reform, uh, which will feature remarks from Federal Reserve Governor Jay Powell. Uh, we're delighted to have Jay with us this morning. Let me give a very brief uh, uh, introduction for Jay, and then uh, he'll come up for his remarks. Um, Jay's been a governor at the Fed since the, uh, May of 2012. Some of what Jay does as a governor is very visible to the public, serving on the Federal Open Market Committee and giving regular talks on the economy, monetary policy, and financial stability. But as I know from my own days of the Fed, a lot of what Jay and other Fed governors do is behind the scenes and is not very visible to the public, uh, including um, all the administrative work of running the Federal Reserve Board and overseeing the Federal Reserve System, which is a big job even when the board is fully staffed. But of course, there are currently three vacant seats on the board, and Jay tells me he's chairing four of the seven internal board administrative committees, and that he's looking forward to a regulator Relief Act sometime soon in the form of new governors to fill the vacancies. Before joining the Fed, Jay had a distinguished career in the investment banking and private equity world, including as a partner at the Carlisle Group from 1997 to 2005. Jay's interest in housing finance goes back a long way, at least as far back as his service in the Treasury Department in the early 1990s. In preparing for this event, I came across a transcript of his confirmation hearing in 1990 to become Assistant Treasury Secretary for Domestic Finance. I thought it was significant that in his opening statement, he cited the Treasury's proposals for ensuring the safety and soundness of Fannie and Freddie, noting that in exchange for federal backing, which at that point was only implicit, the GSEs, and I quote, should be required to be strongly capitalized and to submit to effective and appropriate federal supervision. That was good advice, which unfortunately wasn't followed. And now, more than a quarter century later, we're still dealing with the fallout from having failed to ensure the safety and soundness of the GSEs. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Governor Jay Powell. Good morning. Um, thanks very much, Steve. Thanks to AEI for this nice invitation. Thanks to all of you for coming out on this rainy morning. Um, so my topic today is um, the urgent need for fundamental reform of our system of housing finance, which is the great unfinished business of post-financial crisis reform, in my view. I should start by saying that the Federal Reserve is not charged with designing or evaluating proposals for housing finance reform. But we are responsible for regulating and supervising banking institutions to ensure their safety and soundness, and more broadly, for the stability of the financial system. A robust, well-capitalized, well-regulated housing finance system is vital to achieving these goals and to the long-run health of our economy. We need a system that provides mortgage credit in good times and bad to a broad range of creditworthy borrowers. While reforms have addressed some of the problems of the pre-crisis system, there is broad agreement that the job is far from done. The status quo may feel comfortable today, but it is also unsustainable. Today, the federal government's role in housing finance is even greater than it was before the crisis. The overwhelming majority of new mortgages are issued with government banking, backing in a highly concentrated securitization market. That leaves us with both taxpayer liability and systemic risk. It is important to learn the right lessons from the failure of the old system, and we can also apply lessons from post-crisis banking reform. Above all, we need to move to a system that attracts ample amounts of private capital to stand between the housing sector credit risk and taxpayers. We should also use market forces to increase competition and help to drive innovation. The financial crisis ended in 2009 and the economy has just completed its eighth consecutive year of expansion. We are at or near full employment. The housing market is generally strong, although it's still recovering in some regions. To preserve these gains, we need to ensure the stability of the financial system. And with that goal in mind, we are actually nearing completion of a comprehensive program to raise potential standards for our most systemically important banks. 
but fundamental housing finance reform, including reform to address the ultimate status of Fannie and Freddie, remains on the to-do list. As memory of the crisis fade, as memories of the crisis fade, the next few years may present our last best chance to finish these critical reforms. Failure, failure to do so would risk repeating the mistakes of the past. Uh, I'll spend just a, a couple of minutes on the pre-crisis system before moving on. Congress created Fannie Mae in 1938 and Freddie Mac in 1970, and for years, uh, many years, these institutions prudently pursued their core mission of enhancing the availability of credit for housing. Beginning in the early 1980s, Fannie and Freddie helped to facilitate the development of the securitization market for home mortgages. They purchased and bundled mortgage loans and sold the resulting MBS to investors. Fannie and Freddie also guaranteed payment of principal and interest on the MBS. And with this guarantee in place, MBS investors took the risk of changing interest rates and the GSEs took the risk of default on the underlying mortgages. Thanks to the growth in securitization, Fannie and Freddie have dominated U.S. housing finance since the late 1980s. This pre-crisis system did its job for many years. By promoting standardization, structuring, structuring securities to meet a broad range of investor risk appetites and guaranteeing MBS, Fannie and Freddie brought greater liquidity to mortgage markets and made mortgages more affordable. But the system ultimately failed due to fundamental flaws in its structure. In the early days of securitization, the chance that either GSE would ever fail to honor its guarantee seemed highly remote. <clears throat> but that question always loomed in the background. Who would bear the credit risk if a GSE were to become insolvent and could not perform? Would Congress really allow the GSE to fail to honor its obligations, given the potentially devastating impact that would have on mortgage fun funding and the housing market more broadly? The law stated explicitly that the government did not stand behind the GSEs or their MBS, as Fannie and Fred Freddie frequently pointed out, in order to avoid tougher regulation. Nonetheless, under investors understandably came to believe that the two GSEs were too big to fail and they priced in an implicit federal guarantee behind all GSE obligations. In the end, the investors were right, of course. The implicit government guarantee also meant that investors, and that includes banks, the GSEs themselves, and other investors around the world, did not do careful due diligence on the underlying mortgage pools. Thus, securitization also enabled declining lending standards. Of course, this was not just a problem of the GSEs, Private label securitizations also help to enable lower underwriting standards. Over time, the system's bad incentives caused the two GSEs to change their behavior and take on ever greater risks. The GSEs had become powerful advocates for their own bottom lines, providing substantial financial support for political candidates who supported the GSE agenda. Legislative reforms in the 1990s and the public-private structure led managements to expand the GSE's balance sheets to enormous size, underpinned by wafer-thin slivers of capital, driving high shareholder returns and very high compensation for management. These and many other factors led to extremely lax lending conditions, and the early 2000s became the era of Alt-A, low-doc, and no-doc loans. These practices contributed to the catastrophic failure of the housing system. And almost nine years ago, in September 2008, Fannie and Freddie were put into temporary conservatorship and received taxpayer injections totaling 187 and change billion. In the end, the system privatized the gains and socialized the losses. The buildup of risks is clear in hindsight, but many officials and commentators raised concerns long before the collapse. The long-standing internal structural weaknesses of the old system ultimately led to disastrous consequences for homeowners, taxpayers, the financial system, and the economy. Before considering the path forward, it's important to acknowledge that today's housing sector is healthier in, and in some respects safer than it was in 2005. Although there are significant regional differences, national data show that housing prices have fully recovered from their gut-wrenching 35% drop during the crisis. Mortgage default rates have returned to pre-crisis levels. Mortgage credit is available and affordable for strong borrowers. There's also been meaningful progress in reforming the old system. 
Uh, in 2008, Congress enacted the Housing and Economic Recovery Act, or HERA, which among other things created the FHFA modeled on the FDIC. And under FHFA's oversight, the two GSEs retained portfolios have declined to about half of their pre-crisis size and are expected to continue on that downward path. The FHFA and the GSEs have also been working develop a, to develop a market for the GSEs to lay off their credit risk. And these innovative transactions have raised about $50 billion in private capital that now stands between taxpayers and mortgage credit risk in the GSE's portfolios. In addition, the creation of a common securitization platform should strengthen the GSE's securitization infrastructure and facilitate further reforms with an eye toward enhancing competition. New regulations have also been put in place since the crisis with the goal of encouraging sound underwriting of mortgage loans. Today, lenders need to make a good faith effort to, to, to determine that the borrower has the ability to repay the mortgage. Moreover, if the, letter if the lender provides a qualified mortgage contract to the borrower, then the lender needs to meet certain other requirements. For example, some contract features such as interest only, an interest-only period or negative amortization are taboo. Upfront points and fees are limited as well. Turning to today's challenges. Uh, these reforms represent movement in the right direction, but they leave us well short of where we need to be. Despite the GSE's significant role in this key market, there is no clarity about their future. Uh, when they were put into conservatorship, Treasury Secretary Paulson noted that, and this is a quote, policymakers must view this next period as a timeout where we have stabilized the GSEs while we decide their future and structure. Almost nine years into this timeout, the federal government's domination of the housing sector has grown and is actually greater than it was before the crisis. Fannie, Freddie, the FHA, and the Department of Veterans Affairs now have a combined share of about 80% of the purchased mortgage market, market, with the remaining 20% held by private financial institutions. And after reaching nearly 30% of the market before the crisis, private label securitization has dwindled to almost nothing today. <clears throat> The two GSEs remain in government, government conservatorship with associated contingent liabilities to U.S. taxpayers. Fannie and Freddie have remitted just over $270 billion of profits to the Treasury, more than paying back the government's initial investment. However, under current terms of the contracts that govern their access to Treasury funds, their capital will decline to zero by January 1, 2018. Today, Fannie and Freddie have more than $5 trillion of MBS and corporate debt outstanding, which is widely held and receives various forms of special regulatory treatment. And because of their scale, these enterprises continue to serve as important standard setters and significant counterparties to other firms. While mortgage credit is available, uh, widely available to most traditional mortgage borrowers. Those with lower credit scores face significantly higher standards and lower credit availability than before the crisis. I imagine we can all agree that we do not want to go back to the poor underwriting standards used by originators prior to the crisis, but it may also be that the current system is too rigid and that a lack of innovation and product choice has limited mortgage credit availability to some creditworthy households. According to an American banker survey, in 2016, only 9% of mortgage originations failed to meet QM contract criteria, down from 16% in 2013. The same survey reported that almost one-third of U.S. banks make only qualified mortgage loans, despite the fact that FHA and GSE-eligible mortgages are exempt from the QM requirements until January 2021 or until housing finance reform is enacted, whichever date comes first. The post-crisis reform program for our largest banks presents an appropriate standard against which the housing finance giants should be judged. After eight years of reform, our largest banking institutions are now far stronger and safer. Common equity capital held by the eight U.S. globally systemically important banks has more than doubled to $825 billion from about $300 billion before the crisis. <clears throat> After the crisis revealed significant underlying vulnerabilities, these institutions now hold $2.3 trillion in high-quality liquid assets, <coughs> or 25% of their total assets, which is far higher than before the crisis. 
Under rigorous annual stress tests, these banks must demonstrate a high level of understanding of their risks and the ability to manage them. And they have to survive severely adverse economic scenarios with high levels of post-stress capital. They also have to file regular resolution plans that have made them significantly more resolvable should they fail. All of these measures were implemented to reduce the risk that a future crisis will result in taxpayer support and to help ensure that the financial system could continue to function even in the event that one of these banks were to default. <clears throat> it's ironic that the housing finance system should escape fundamental reform efforts. The housing bubble of the early 2000s was, after all, an essential proximate cause of the crisis. Housing is the single largest asset class in our financial system, with total outstanding residential real estate owned by households of $24 trillion rough, and roughly $10 trillion in single-family mortgage debt. While post-crisis regulation has addressed mortgage lending from a consumer protection standpoint, the important risks to taxpayers and the broader economy and the financial system have still not been robustly addressed. The most obvious and direct step forward would be to require ample amounts of private capital to support housing finance activities, as we do in the banking system. We should also strive for a system that can continue to function even in the event of a default by any firm. No single housing finance institution should be too big to fail. Greater amounts of private capital could come through a variety of sources, including through the entry of multiple private guarantors who would ensure a portion of the credit risk, through risk sharing agreements, or through expanded use of credit risk transfers. Although private capital must surely be part of the reform effort, there may be limits to the amount of risk that we can credibly expect the private sector to insure. It is extremely difficult to appropriately price the insurance of catastrophic risk, the risk of a severe, widespread housing crisis. And both the private sector insurance industry <coughs> and the government have struggled with this, particularly with how to smooth the consistent collection of premiums with the irregular payout of potentially enormous losses that may, may be needed only once or twice in a century. Furthermore, losses can be correlated across asset uh, classes and geographies in these catastrophic events, which can render risk, diversion, risk diversification strategy, strategies ineffective. Fannie and Freddie have successfully transferred some credit risk to the private sector, but have thus far avoided selling off much of the, of the cash, catastrophic credit risk, arguing that doing so is not economical. After promising legislative initiatives have moved forward but fallen short of enactment, the air is again thick with housing finance reform proposals. As I mentioned at the outset, housing finance reform has important implications for the Federal Reserve's oversight of financial institutions and for the U.S. economy and its financial stability. While I would not presume to judge these reform proposals, I will offer some principles for reform. And these principles are based on the lessons learned from the old system's collapse and from the experience of post-crisis banking reform. First, we ought to do whatever we can to make the possibility of future housing bailouts seem as remote as possible. <clears throat> Not seem, but be as remote as possible. Housing can be a volatile sector, and housing is often found at the heart of financial crises. Excuse me one second. <clears throat> Housing can be a volatile sector, <clears throat> and housing is often found at the heart of financial crises. Our housing financial institutions were not and are not structured with that in mind. Extreme fluctuations in credit availability for housing hurt vulnerable households, reduce affordability and availability, and as we have seen, can threaten financial stability. As with banks, the goal should be to ensure that our housing finance system can continue to function even in the face of significant house price declines and severe economic conditions. Changing the system to attract large amounts of private capital would be a major step toward that goal. The question of the government's role in the new system is a challenging one for Congress. Many of the well-known reform proposals include some role for government. Some argue that the government cannot avoid bearing the deep-in-the-tail risk of a catastrophic housing crisis. A number of proposals incorporate a government guarantee to cover this catastrophic risk, 
to take effect after a significant stack of private capital is wiped out. And that brings me to my second principle. If Congress, Congress chooses to go in this direction, any such guarantee should be explicit and transparent and should apply to securities, not to institutions. Reform should not leave us with any institutions that are so important as to be candidates for too big to fail. Third, we should promote greater competition in this market. The economics of securitization do not require a duopoly. Yet there's no way for private firms to acquire a GSE charter and enter the industry. It's akin to having only two banks with federal deposit insurance, which would make competition by other banks difficult, if not impossible. Greater competition would help to reduce the systemic importance of the GSEs and spur more innovation. Greater competition also requires a level playing field, allowing secondary market access to a wide range of lenders and thereby giving homeowners a choice among many potential mortgage lenders and products. Fourth, it is worth considering simple approaches that restructure and repurpose parts of the existing architecture of our housing finance system. We know that housing reform is difficult, Completely redrawing the system may not be necessary and could complicate the search for a solution. Using the existing architecture would allow for a continued, smooth, gradual transition. Fifth and last, we need to identify and build upon areas of bipartisan agreement. In my personal view, at this late stage, we should not be holding out for the perfect answer. We should be looking for the best feasible plan to, ex to escape the unacceptable status quo. In conclusion, uh, I'll close on an optimistic note and say that I see two reasons why this is a good time to address the housing finance system's shortcomings. First, the economy and the housing sector are healthy. It would be far more disruptive and more difficult to implement fundamental structural changes during difficult economic times. Second, memories of the crisis are fading. If Congress does not enact reforms over the next few years, we are at risk of settling for the status quo a government-dominated mortgage market with insufficient private capital to protect taxpayers and insufficient competition to drive innovation. There is a serious risk, if not in fact a likelihood, that this state of affairs may persist indefinitely, leaving our housing finance system in a semi-permanent limbo. Fortunately, we are blessed with a growing menu of reform options available for public, public vetting. And there appear to be broad areas of agreement among them. One of those plans, or more likely a combination of different features of various plans, might well suffice to move us to a better system. Housing finance reform will protect taxpayers from another bailout, it will be good for households and the economy, and it will go some distance toward mitigating the systemic risk that the GSEs still pose. Thanks very much for listening, and I look forward to our discussions. <clears throat> Q&A by um, having a few questions that I'll pose to Jay, and then we'll open it up to the audience. Jay, thank you very much for your remarks. I thought they were right on target, and I certainly agree with the point you made near the end that we shouldn't hold out for the perfect reform uh, or the perfect system. Uh, in, in lieu of doing uh, something that <clears throat> takes us in a better direction than we are now. Um, so let me start off by asking, um, under Chairman Greenspan, uh, the Fed actually took a pretty active role in discussions about the GSEs, but <clears throat> in recent years, the Fed has really not done that um, and hasn't really had much contribution to the discussion about housing finance reform. So. First question, really touching on things that you talked about a bit in your speech, but maybe can really reiterate. Why are you speaking up now? What is urgent about now? And what do you see as a Fed governor uh, that causes you to feel like you need to speak up? Right. Um, I, I guess what really provoked me to come forward was this, this feeling that we're, we, we're almost at a, at a now or never moment here. It's been nine years since the crisis almost. Uh, it's been almost nine years since um, Fannie and Freddie went into conservatorship. It's healthy, healthy economic times, we're at full employment, all the things I said in my remarks, and if not now, when? So it really seems like the, the risk that we settle into this um, current situ situation for, for, for the long run are, 
are very great. And so let me say why I think it's inadequate. Um, you know, we have, and I, I would say we've done, there have been significant um, improvements, uh, but uh, at the same time, we haven't really addressed the big issue, which is the financial stability issue around Fannie and Freddie. Mm -hmm. There are these two large government corporations which still have a monopoly on securitization, and until we address that, we really have not addressed the financial stability issue, which exists now but can, can certainly grow over time. I've also spent the last, you know, five plus years working on banking reform and going through, you know, very difficult, challenging uh, uh, program of raising prudential standards for banks, and um, you know, hoping that the same would happen with respect to the GSEs. But, and it has to some extent, but really not on the fundamental issue of the end game for the two big GSEs. So, I, I, I thought about going coming forward in 2014, actually, when the last time there was legislation being considered. Uh, and actually, as you mentioned, Steve, I, these issues, I go way back with these issues, but, you know, the reason I came forward now is just because I feel like we're losing our chance to, to move forward. Yeah. Okay, good. <clears throat> um, I mean, I, I agree with the sense of urgency, but given the partisan divisions on Capitol Hill these days, it's hard, at least for me, to see um, a legislative solution actually being enacted in the next few years. So. What role do you see for yourself in moving the process forward? And what do you personally hope to add to the debate? Um, I would say I'm, I don't consider myself an expert uh, on um, you know, what, what will happen in Congress. But I do think there, I do see um, a bipartisan discussion going on. I hear people from, from all sides saying that they, that they find the current status quo unacceptable. And I see constructive movements. So, you know, in terms of what, what I can do and what the Fed can do, I think really the first thing is to, is to emphasize that message that the current structure does expose the taxpayer and does carry substantial systemic risk over time. And that's really in the heart of what we, you know, heart of what we do. It's not a current risk. It's not, you know, the economy is healthy, the housing system is healthy, but if we don't get off of this, then we will find ourselves, I believe, in time back in a bad place with a lot of exposure to the taxpayer and financial instability issues. The second thing we can do, which uh, traditionally the Fed has, we have a lot of really good staff, as you will certainly agree, Steve, having worked there. Um, uh, and we do provide technical help on, on a range of issues that Congress has request. So we do a lot of that back and forth, mm -hmm. just behind the scenes, working with evaluating the effect of different programs and, and that sort of thing on the economy. So we would certainly plan on doing that here. That's great. I mean, this, the Fed staff has tremendous expertise that really yeah. could help. Um, do you envision the Fed as an entity rather than you as a single governor um, becoming involved in any official capacity in the housing reform debate? That's hard to say. Um, I do speak only for myself here today. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll just have to see how that evolves over time. I would imagine the answer will be yes, but time will tell. Okay. Um, in your remarks, um, you encourage Congress to address housing reform and to do it relatively soon. Um, but there are definitely people out there who would say, you know, why do we really need to do anything? Um, why risk the unknown? You know, Fannie and Freddie are making money. It's actually getting turned over to the taxpayers. Their uh, book of business now is a lot less risky than it was during the run-up to the financial crisis. And as you noted in your comments, um, they're beginning to transfer some of that risk to private sector investors. Um, there's still a lot more to be done, but they're moving in that direction. So given all of this, and I, I think you've touched on it, but let me just come back to the point. Why not just leave the current system as it is? Um, so let me start by saying I, I do agree that credit risk transfer transactions and the common securitization platform, these are, these are very positive moves, and I think uh, you know are moving us along the right path. But I, but I, I think your question is right in the bullseye. Really, this the the risk is that that enough people say, oh, this is working. Why should we change it? Mm -hmm. That we never really do address the you know the status of these large government created corporations that have a monopoly on securitization that are in conservatorship on the on the federal government's balance sheet. What we, we have to deal with that issue, it seems to me. Or, I mean, a, any company that stands at the front of the parade of the entire U.S. housing sector over time has 
it will have the ability to, you know, to affect public policy in ways that favor its, its desires. That was certainly the lesson I learned from, the, uh, from my exposure in the 1990s. So mm -hmm. I, feel, I feel like we, we do need to grasp that and, and address that very difficult issue, set of issues, really, um, and, and do some of the things that I, that I mentioned. You know, get a lot more private capital in front of these things, uh, in front of this, these risks, and, and also um, don't go back to a system where we're relying on one or two players, uh, which have been proven to be too big to fail. That I would be, it would be, so, I'd be sorry to see that happen at the end of a crisis where we've done so much, I think, to move away from too big to fail with respect to the banking system. Right. <clears throat> so one of the topics that your speech didn't say much about was affordable housing. Um, since 1992, the GSEs have had affordable housing goals, and they still do. So um, any reform that Congress will pass almost surely will have some affordable housing elements to it. So let me ask, what are your views in this area? So let me just say, in my speech, I, <clears throat> I did stick to uh, kind of the Fed's homeland. I didn't uh, feel like I have a license to go have opinions on things that are, that are less well-connected to the fundamental concern that I have here, which is, which is that of financial stability and the long-run growth of the economy. Um, there, there are a number of things that I didn't talk about in the speech which, which are, connect less well to that, and, and I do understand them as realities. First of all, what you said, I totally agree with what you said. Affordable housing concerns are, are significant and will, of course, have to be addressed in, uh, in any bill that has a hope of passing both houses of Congress. Um, I, there are other things, too, that I didn't talk about. You know, the, f the, the fact of a TBA market and a 30-year mortgage are things that are almost certainly uh, going to be a reality going forward in our system. But again, I'm, I, I don't see those as first order for, for what I was trying to accomplish. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so your, your talk really focused on Fannie and Freddie, but of course there's another um, entity, uh, the FHA, which has a substantial share of the mortgage market and that operates with the full government guarantee. Um, FHA's book is a lot riskier than the GSEs. Um, AI does stress tests on all of the government guaranteed loans using extensive loan level data. And our estimate is that if we were to have an unfortunate replay of the financial crisis, that about a quarter of FHA's <coughs> recent originations for home purchase loans would default. So um, it does focus the need, I think, on uh, thinking about FHA as part of a, a unified, uh, comprehensive view about uh, housing finance. So let me ask, what role do you see FHA playing in the housing finance system of the future? And, and what do you think FHA's mission should be? Um, so I see FHA as having an important mission, particularly with respect to first-time home buyers. Mm -hmm. uh, as you know, different plans have, uh, and different bills have taken different approaches to, ha to incorporating FHA in the plans. I don't really, you know, there are so many housing agencies, I, I really don't want to um, speculate about where any particular chess piece should wind up in the end. You know, Ginny May, there's, there's many, many housing agencies in the United States, or housing related uh, agencies. So I would just say that's, I would default to the, to the thought that that's a, uh, that's a question for Congress. <clears throat> All right, well, why don't we turn now to questions from the audience. Um, I'll serve as the traffic cop for the questions. Um, why don't you uh, raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question. Uh, if you do, wait for the mic, identify yourself by name, give your uh, affiliation, and then please actually ask a question. Uh, no speeches, please. Okay, thank you. Right here. Uh, please, please wait for the mic and identify yourself. Hi, Governor. Paul Leonard with the Financial Services Roundtable. Have you thought about uh, structure, organizational structure for new entities in a reform system? And like, for example, the private guarantors, and could Fannie and Freddie be re rechartered perhaps by a regulator, not by Congress, in a new system? And, I guess give us your thoughts on what you think might be structural components of new entities in a new system that would take up more of the risk than just two yeah, GSEs. I'm afraid I'm going to disappoint you. Uh, so 
um, there are a lot of great ideas, and there are still new ideas coming forward. So, I mean, you, there, there are just so many ways to get there, and that you, you identified one of them. You know, there, <clears throat> there are different, different plans have different end games for Fannie and Freddie. They have different ways to share the risk. Um, and uh, I don't want to, I mean, I, I'm familiar with all the plans and, and um, you know, how they all work. I wouldn't want to pick a winner or say that there is a winner, really. It, it's almost, at this point, I wouldn't want to let, make, let the, make the perfect the enemy of the good. And I don't think it's for us to say, take this plan. This is the one, this is the one that I like as a Fed governor or that the Fed likes. I don't really think that's our role. It's more to say, I mean, uh, there's a lot of commonality here. And, um, you know, pick the best things, try to move forward, negotiate, and try to come up with something that's better than the current approach. So I know that's not what you're hoping to hear, but. <clears throat> the gentleman here in the second row. <clears throat> My name is Carl Pulzer, and I'm with the Center on Capital and Social Equity. Is, is the mic on? Oh, I thought it was on. Can you do that for me? <coughs> Carl Pulzer, Center on Capital and Social Equity. I'm just wondering, uh, and that housing is not an expertise of ours, so this is looking from the outside. Yeah. What specific changes in incentives and controls could be made to the two GSEs to encourage or incentivize a, a, them giving, a, facilitating a greater competition. And like, like exa for example, this is hypothetical. Like if you're over 60% of the market share, you have to give more, and part of your profit would have to go to, to subsidize low-income housing. I mean, it, w are there certain things you could incentivize them with? Incentivize them, can, sorry, Carl, could you do, to incentivize, incentivize them, them to do to, what? To function in a more competitive mm -hmm. market. Well, uh, yes, the answer, I think the answer is there are lots of things. And, but mainly the, the way to do that is to create competition for them. The, the, two, the two GSEs have, they're a duopoly, right? So they set standards, everyone deals with them. And <clears throat> it's, it's hard to, it's hard for new mortgage products to, to find a home if they're not, they have to sort of go through Fannie and Freddie. <clears throat> so more, more clearly, more competition would lead to more innovation. Um, you know, we, we, we definitely raised the standards in this country for mortgage availability after the crisis to a very high level. By most measures, overall credit availability is not good. It's great if you have a, if you have a FICO score of 750, but it's not great if you're, you know, below 680. So, uh, and I'm not saying, no one, again, nobody wants to go back to the pre-crisis era and give a mortgage to anybody who walks in the door, whether they want it or not. Um, but um, at the same time, we, we need to explore whether we've drawn the line too high, I think. And, and uh, I think more competition can be a big weapon in that game. So not just, I wouldn't want to see us go to a system where, where the two GSEs are the only sources of securitization. It would be better to have multiple sources of, of competitive capital and have market share more broadly spread. I think it would address your concerns. Um, gentlemen, right back here, and then I'll come to this side next. Um, Jesse Arm, ACG Analytics. And uh, my question was, can you please go into detail on why you believe a security level guarantee is a better option than an entity level guarantee? Sure. Um, uh, the idea of, of catastrophic risk is to protect, you know, the, 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 the market. And I think you do that by protecting the securities, uh, by, you know, protecting the, the investors in the securities in the MBS. To protect the actual entity, which is the operations of the entity, it's the management of the entity, it's the salaries and bonuses of the, of the senior executives of the entity, it's the entity itself. I think that's, um, that's a whole different thing. That really is too big to fail. I think if you have, you know, if you do, if you do, I haven't said that we do, but if you do need a catastrophic risk guarantee, it should be as narrow as possible, in my view, and it should be on, you know, the actual mortgage default risk. That's the problem we're solving. We're not solving a problem of saving individual institutions from the consequences of their risky actions. Yes, gentleman in the front. <clears throat> Hi, John Heltman, the American Banker. Um, a question, you, you mentioned the, uh, that the 
post-crisis reforms uh, for banks have been largely successful. Capital has been increased, uh, and they're much more stable than they used to be. Um, would maybe the easiest way of solving this problem with the GSCs be to uh, apply the same kind of principles to the GSCs via FSOC and making the GSCs um, CIFIs? It's an interesting question. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I don't mean to say that uh, bank capital is the answer to everything, and I do think you need you also need uh, structural reform of the industry. We need to get away from two government companies which dominate and, and are a duopoly. So it's not just a question of higher capital standards and that kind of thing. I think there needs to be legislation that would uh, restructure those entities and come to a come to a place that meets the principles that I articulated. Yes. Hi, uh, Neil Haggerty with MLEX Market Insight. Um, Senator Crapo has said uh, numerous times that housing finance reform is a priority for 2017. I'm curious to know your thoughts about um, whether this is a realistic priority and you think uh, any reform can actually happen this year? Um, you know, again, I'm not, uh, nobody should pay me to handicap the possibility of legislation on the, on the Hill. It's not something I consider myself expert in. Um, and I would say it isn't just 2017, it's really this Congress, <clears throat> th these next few years um, that I think are the key zone. It's not essential to get something done by the end of this year. But, and I, I, I think it can, because I, I do think if you watched the hearing last week and looked at the transcript, you can see there is really significant agreement on both sides of the aisle that the current system needs fundamental reform. Many good things have happened, but we have to grasp the really difficult issue of what will happen with what, what should be the structure of, of the GSEs going forward and, and the overall market structure. So and I, I think you start with some bipartisan agreement. You start with a bunch of plans, which are out there, that have significant common areas of, uh, you know, what that they cover and agree on. And um, you know, I want to take the optimistic uh, point of view that uh, the alternative is is so unattractive, and and it just you know we just will have failed to address one of the major causes of the crisis, and I, I just hate to think that that'll be the case. And so I, I I want to take a constructive view and an optimistic view that we will get something done, you know, before memories really do fade, and it just becomes the new normal. <clears throat> I don't see any questions right now, so let, oh, I'm sorry, uh, woman in the back. Christina Zausner, Commercial Real Estate Finance Council. Given your interest in competition in the private sector, the private REM, RMBS, and I guess also um, maybe multifamily in uh, private CMBS, I was wondering if you had any views on the potential impact of the fundamental review of the trading book and those standards, how they might impact that market here. So the question is about the fundamental review of the trading book. Um, yeah, I think we're, you know, we're fairly far out from even proposing that. And uh, as you know, we're, it's, we're still looking at that in, in Basel. And then it will take some time to take the Basel proposal and, can, and uh, translate it into the U.S. context and then put it out for comment. So it's an awfully long way away to be speculating about the effect. And this, of course, we would we would understand and 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 hear any concerns about credit availability that would arise from what we do propose. But I mean, it's it's a good it's a good a good way out on the calendar before that happens. <clears throat> um, while others are thinking of questions, I'll, I'll try to <coughs> follow up on one thing you mentioned before. Jay, you said that you were planning to be personally involved <coughs> in trying to push this process along, which I think is great. Do you envision that involving more than speeches of the type that you're doing today, but actually talking directly to members of Congress, either privately or through testimonies on the topic? You know, <clears throat> as I mentioned, we don't have a formal role, formal role in this. Um, I, you know, I've spent a ton of time up on the Hill and questions about, uh, about GSE reform, about housing finance reform 
come up all the time in those, in those uh, conversations, mm -hmm. just in general. You talk about a range of things. This is one I'll certainly talk about. I don't, I, you know, I, I'd like to do whatever seems to be broadly helpful. Mm -hmm. That's all. I don't, you know, I don't expect that I'm going to personally drive this forward. Yeah. But, you know, if I can play a constructive role, I'd really like to. I was very pleased that uh, um, Senator Carapo and Senator Brown, um, you know, are, are holding a series of hearings at Senate Banking. And, um, you know, again, I think it's a constructive process and I'd like to help in any way I can. Okay. So one follow-up to that. I know the Treasury Department <clears throat> is thinking about GSE reform. They haven't come out with a specific proposal. It is <clears throat> there currently consultation between the board and the Treasury on these ideas? Or do you, and if not, do you see that happening going forward? There's all, it, with any Treasury and any, and any um, uh, Fed, there's all, as you know, there's always a, a, a series of contacts going on at mm -hmm. various levels all the time, and, and that is certainly the case now as well. Um, I, I, know, I've, I know that they're working on, the White House and Treasury are working on principles or some kind of, a, of, a, of something. I'm not sure exactly what they're working on, but they're, and they're working on something, and as they go forward on that, it would be a natural thing for, uh, for them to, you know, consult with our experts. As you mentioned, we have mm -hmm. a number of... Uh, of really top housing experts, uh, several of which are here today, one of which has jury duty. Um, so, uh, um, you know, it, naturally there'll be a discussion of that nature, I would think. Yeah. Okay. Other questions? All right, well, um, thank you very much, and thank you, Jay, for uh, being with us today. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.